Monday morning, I watched with enormous pride as Harbor Air made history with a test flight of the world's first fully electric commercial aircraft. Harbor Air is a regional airline that provides an important transportation link between coastal communities in southern BC. They have been working in partnership with Magnex to become the world's first fully electric airline by converting their seaplanes to e-planes. With the success of Tuesday's test flight, they moved closer to the goal and positioned a Canadian business as a global leader in zero emissions air travel. This company has seen both the challenge and opportunity posed by climate change and have stepped up for our children and grandchildren. I can't wait to take my first trip on an e-plane. Congratulations, Harbour Air. Are the, uh, is working okay? I just want to double check. Everyone can hear me? Tout le monde peut m'entendre? Okay, the Honourable Member for Surrey Newton. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to thank the residents of Surrey Newton for once again placing their trust in me. I'm truly humbled by this support and will continue to remain highly accessible and more importantly, I will always put their voices ahead of all other considerations. With that in mind, I would like to acknowledge the youth-led volunteer organization Sings Doing Things on the fourth annual Food and Toy Drive. This past Sunday, over 225 volunteers came together to support the Surrey Food Bank in their single largest collection effort of 2019. Over 60,000 pounds of food was collected through the generous donation from the community. I want to give a special thanks to the donors, organizers, and volunteers of Sings Doing Things for all their hard work in helping the less fortunate. Bravo. A member for Brendan Sewers. I rise to proudly pay tribute to a great Canadian business icon, Mr. Don Penny, upon his recent passing. Don's legacy is acknowledged across the country as he was a founding partner of the accounting company Myers Norris Penny, now known as MNP. Becoming CEO in 1977, he was, the proud, he was proud that the small accounting firm that started in Brandon, Manitoba, now has offices across Canada and employs more than 4,500 people. In recognition of his business acumen and philanthropic spirit, he received our nation's highest honour, the Order of Canada. But Don never forgot his roots. Whether he was born in Brandon, Clear Lake, or Bay Street, he was always the same kind and generous man, helping everyone he knew. I offer sincere condolences to his wife Sandra, son Darren, daughter Leanne, stepdaughters Rhonda and Carla, and five grandchildren. Canada, and particularly Western Manitoba, has lost a great leader, visionary, and philanthropist in Mr. Don Penny. May he rest in eternal peace. The Honourable Member for Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, I rise in the House today to thank the people of Saint Laurent from the bottom of my heart who yet again have put their trust in me by electing me. Opportunity to thank all of my volunteers who donated out of their time and money to make it possible for me, for me to return to this place to represent the community and the riding that I love so much once again. With the holidays quickly approaching, I'd like to take this opportunity to wish everyone a very happy and healthy holiday season. Whether you're, help, you're celebrating Christmas, Hanukkah, or Kwanzaa, I hope that this is a time of joy, peace, prosperity, and lots and uh, lots of quality time with your family and loved ones. Je vous souhaite à toutes et à tous. I wish you all a very happy holiday and a good year. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. Mr. Speaker, I believe that being able to die in serenity and peace without suffering is something that we all hope for, is it not? Gloria Taylor. Kay Carter, Jean Trochon, Nicole Gladieu have this message. My death, like my life, belongs to me. Our right to make our own choices as set out in the law through the principle or the right to self-determination and its corollary, free and informed consent, is never in doubt throughout our lives, even 
during emergencies. So why then would it be otherwise for people who are facing unbearable suffering or an incurable and irreversible illness or affliction? Why should it be otherwise for mentally sound individuals who are not depressive, depressed or suicidal and who wish to show their desire to live their life to the fullest until they reach their threshold of what is tolerable? Colleagues, let us make medically assisted dying a priority for this parliament without partisanship. The bloc will cooperate we have the duty to move forward together. The Honourable Member for Scarborough Eaton Court. Speaker, from the neighbourhoods of Wishing Well, Bamberg Circle, Lamoureux Steels and Glendower, I want to thank the people of Scarborough Eaton Court for the honour of representing them once again. Shepherd Village is Toronto's largest not-for-profit seniors community and has been in my riding since 1961. They are an active community and just recently had their milestone birthday party celebration, celebrating residents turning 95 years old and up. You really do have to be 95 years up to be part of this group. Congratulations to Olive Meyer, who will be celebrating her 108th birthday soon. Wow. Seniors are important, and that is why we look forward to providing an increase to their OAS by 10% for those 75 years and up, and a 25% increase to the Canada Pension Plan survivor benefits for widows and widowers. Thank you. Honourable member for Tobik Mactaquack. Merci, Mr. President. Today I rise to thank the good people of Tobik Mactaquack who elected me to be their oh, voice here in Ottawa. Yeah. I also want to thank my family, especially my beautiful wife, Crystal, and our three children, Veda, Walker, and Mariah, for being there to support me. During the campaign, my father's lunch bucket became a very important symbol to me. My father is 68 years old and still works at the pulp mill in Nakawick. It's because of people like my father and mother who work in our factories, wait on our tables, as well as the farmers who grow our food and those who develop our natural resources, as well as those who truck and ship our goods, that I am here today. They are the ones who are so often overlooked, ignored, and increasingly looked down upon. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, those who've been forgotten and feel disconnected from the decisions being made here will always have a voice. They will be heard. They will have their rights and livelihoods defended until we make it onto that side of the House and bring about the changes they are desperately longing for. On this side of the House and in this seat, we will remember those who carry the buckets. Merci. What we are. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Etobicoke North. I rise today to celebrate the life of an extraordinary human being, Gordon Bean, a tremendous public servant for 30 years and someone with whom I had the privilege to serve. Gord left us far too soon, but not before teaching those whose lives he touched what it means to love, serve, and be a friend. Gord lit up every room he entered and was the friend that everyone only dreamed of having. He was the most selfless person I ever met. Even during the last two months, there was never a thought for himself, only worries about those whom he would leave behind. Gord lived his life to make life better for others, and he did. To Gord's devoted life partner, Craig Richardson, Gord's father, siblings and their family, Shelley Dewar and her family, thank you for sharing him. Let's all take time to be kind and do something for a friend or stranger to honour Gordon Bean. The Honourable Member for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our communities play a key role in protecting our environment and fighting climate change. I commend the District of Squamish for taking a leadership role in the climate emergency by supporting the national and constitutional price on carbon that our government has introduced. Yeah. And this is through its participation as an intervener in the Supreme Court of Canada. It is with great pleasure that I was able to participate in the submission of the application to have How Sound recognized as a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve last week. First Nations, governments, NGOs and citizens have come together to pursue a common goal of a healthy and thriving How Sound. And I'm grateful for the ongoing leadership of Ruth Simons and Joyce Williams, and I wish to congratulate the hard work of the community to date in restoring this important ecosystem. 
I am eager to work with my colleagues on these issues, and I am convinced that by working together, we can achieve great things. The Honourable Member for Barry Innisfil. Mr. Speaker, the residents and businesses of Barry Innisfil have always come to the aid of families, seniors, and the vulnerable in our community at Christmas. This year has been no different. Once again, the South Simcoe Police Service have had another successful Stuff the Command Center toy drive. With food bank use increasing, Pastor Howard and Beulah Courtney of the Innisville Food Bank are doing whatever they can to help families have a magical Christmas dinner, and close to 5,000 pounds of food was recently delivered to the Barry Food Bank by Barry Ford, Barry Chrysler, and 400 Chrysler. But this year has been challenging for a couple of Christmas campaigns. Barry and District Christmas Cheer, which helps 1,700 families, is a far cry from its $250,000 target, and the annual Salvation Army Kettle Drive is also struggling to meet its fundraising goals this season. I know the residents of Barry Innisfil will come through. To everyone working to help those less fortunate, thank you for showing us what Christmas is about. And from my family to yours, a very Merry Christmas, a happy, healthy, and prosperous New Year. The Honourable Member for Orleans. Mr. Speaker. Opportunity to thank the residents of Orléans for giving me their trust on October 21st. Je suis honoré. I am honored to represent them here in this house. On November 30th, I had the pleasure of participating in this year's annual Santa's Parade of Lights for the first time as a member of Parliament for Orléans. Le défilé de lumière. Santa's Parade of Lights was attended by nearly 130,000 people who lined St. Joseph Boulevard, which we proudly call the heart of Orleans. Organized by the members of the Ottawa Professional Firefighters Association, led by Bob Rainbow and Ken Walton, raises money and toys for the Firefighters Help Santa Toy Fund. Congratulations, felicitations to all participants and volunteers who helped make this year's parade such a huge success. Honourable Member for Prince George Peace River, Northern Rockies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Something historic happened this week in my home province of British Columbia. History was made when Harbour Air founder and CEO Greg McDougall completed the world's first flight for an all-electric commercial plane. In the air for less than 10 minutes, Greg said after the flight that the retrofitted float plane wanted to fly. With the potential to fly about 160 kilometres before it needs to be recharged, the retrofitted de Havilland Beaver proves that commercial electric flight is possible. And we can proudly say we did it first in BC. Congratulations to Greg and everyone at Harbour Air and its partner, Magix, for this milestone achievement. Congratulations, Greg. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Dauphin, Swan River, Nipawa. Mr. Speaker, it's a tremendous honour to rise in the House for the very first time to thank the very many people that got me here. Firstly, thank you to the constituents of Dauphin, Swan River, Nipawa for placing their trust in me. It is a privilege to take this seat to represent you and I will never forget who I'm working for. Thank you to my family, to my kids, Hannah, Mike, and especially to my wife, Lee, for the dedication and for their support. As a farmer and an eternal optimist, I hope to achieve real results in this parliament. I pledge to stand up for our farmers and, I, and the communities they support, to constantly advocate for the residents of my riding and defend the rural way of life. It is to what the constituents deserve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, it's becoming more and more expensive for average Canadians to pay their bills. Costs are going up across the country, and in Alberta in particular, families are struggling. Mm. Car insurance rates have gotten more expensive, electricity bills are higher, and just this week, parents are learning that they will have to pay out of their own pockets for their kids to ride the school bus. Oh. On top of all of this, Canadians are still paying some of the highest fees, cell phones, highest fees for cell phones and internet bills in the world because this government refuses to do what's right and put the needs of people ahead of the demands of the telecom industry. No matter where you live in Canada, you should be able to stay connected without breaking the bank. Wishing, hoping, and just claiming that industries regulate themselves it just won't work. Mr. Speaker, Canadians need a price cap on their cell phone and internet bills. The Honourable Member for Berthier, Masquinonger. Mr. Speaker, I would like to pay tribute to two constituents in Berthier, 
Masquinanger for their extraordinary contribution to civil society. At the most recent convocation at the University of Sherbrooke, Amélie Dranville from Ile du Pas received her third Governor General's Medal for her excellent grades. Uh, Getting this prestigious award three times is a rare achievement, and our entire region is very proud of her. Recently, the Commission des Services Juridiques du Québec awarded the Robert Sauvé Prize to Mr. R Michel Purcell, coordinator for the organization Travail de Rue Communautaire in the MRC of Masquinanger. He's a resident of Saint Paulin. He's a pioneer in rural community support services. He has been working with the most marginalized members of our society for over 25 years. This award highlights his exceptional contribution to our community. Congratulations, Mr. Purcell, and best wishes for the future. Number four, Brantford Brant. Mr. Speaker, December 28th will mark the 76th anniversary of the Battle of Ortona, World War II, World War II Italian campaign. The battle described by those who were there as having, quote, the qualities of a nightmare. Ortona took place over the course of eight bitter days during Christmas of 1943. Victory would cost 502 Canadian lives. The best estimates put civilian deaths at 1,300. Sadly, the town had not been evacuated before being overrun by retreating Germans. The fighting in Ortona that Christmas was hand to hand. Ortona is just one example of the extreme sacrifices Canadians made in the hellish conditions of the Italian campaign. The campaign raged on for one year, 10 months, and 22 days. Sacrifices we must always honour lest we forget. The Honourable Member for Montréal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was the last seating week before Christmas. <laughs> and, who, and who knew that Cousner's Christmas poem tradition would be assumed by a Jew? <laughs> Christmas tree. Parliamentarians are asking for presents. On that, we agree. For our Conservative colleagues, I know today has been a shock. In the spirit of the holidays, I'll go straight to the block. <laughs> leader, flush with success. For Mr. Claus, he had but one request. When flying over Quebec, please remove that red suit. It's a religious symbol and ugly to boot. <laughs> For the NDP, Pharmacare was on the list. It's supported by the government, so they've requested a twist. They asked Santa, who was known for passing out candy, to put dental care on the agenda, wouldn't that be dandy? <laughs> and when it comes to our PM, we know what he wants, all being equal. No more hot mics and a new Star Wars sequel. <laughs> so I wish, all, I wish all members some holiday cheer. Enjoy your family and friends and maybe some beer. And when we come back in January, let's see the light. Let's work together for Canadians and let's get it right. <laughs> the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, last month, 71,000 Canadians lost their jobs. 
Now this is shocking when you compare it to the 266,000 jobs created in the same month in the US. Broken down by sector, the story gets even worse. Natural resource jobs in Canada decreased by 3%, while they grew by 15% in America. Manufacturing job creation in the U.S. is more than double what, is it, what it is in Canada. Will the Prime Minister admit that he is creating the conditions for a Made in Canada recession? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, first let me start by recognizing the Honourable Member's service to this House and to his party and hope that he has many more years doing that. I know that we need to look at the month-by-month -month, uh, numbers because they tell us about what's going on across our country. They tell us about Canadians that are struggling, people that are facing up to real challenges in their lives. Our goal is to continue investing. We know that the program we've done over the last four years has created, together with Canadians, over a million new jobs. So we're going to continue to invest to make sure we deal with the challenges across our country, improving the situation for Canadians. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. But the plan is not working, Mr. Speaker. This government scared off 56% of foreign direct investment. $100 billion in energy projects were cancelled. Canadian companies are forced to close and sell their equipment to American companies, who then pursue the operations. It seems like this Prime Minister is doing more to create jobs outside of the country than inside the country. Our country needs to focus on jobs and growth again. Will the Liberals present an economic update this week? Honourable Minister of Finance, it's very important to have a clear approach to the economy and to give Canadians information about uh, the state of our finances. There will be an update in the coming days. Uh, what I can say now is that we will be continuing on our, uh, with our approach to invest in Canadians, uh, to invest in infrastructure, and this way we will have significant growth in the country and low in unemployment. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the problem is that their high tax, high regulation, big borrowing approach isn't working. It may exactly. be creating jobs in other countries. Foreign direct investment into Canada has fallen by 56% since this government came to power. Over $100 million billion of investment in the energy sector has been cancelled. And five G7 countries have a, five G8 countries have a significantly lower unemployment rate than does Canada, including Japan, Germany, the US, the UK, and even Russia. Will the Prime Minister abandon this course of action? Yeah. The Honourable Finance Minister. Speaker, let me start by acknowledging that uh, we do need to continue to focus on how we can ensure the economy does well. Our approach has been to make investments in our economy, and that approach has clearly been working. We've been able to have a higher level of growth than we would have had otherwise. We are expected next year to have among the highest levels of growth in the G7 countries. And of course, we're going to continue to invest across the country to make sure that we have strong employment all across the country, including in those regions of our country that are experiencing particular challenges. Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the official opposition was finally briefed on the new NAFTA after it was signed. And we still have a lot of questions, more questions than answers. We have a lot of concerns about the aluminum, automotive, and agricultural sectors. The Prime Minister would love for us to ratify this agreement without any real scrutiny. When will the Liberals publish impact assessments for this new NAFTA. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me be very clear. This agreement puts an end to the existential threat that our country was facing from the time Donald Trump first threatened to rip up NAFTA. That was a real issue for our economy and our country. We avoided that threat. For Canada, the only step left is to ratify this agreement. Endangering the ratification of the new NAFTA would mean playing partisan politics. 
Oh, and putting that above of the national interest. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. We're asking for the economic impact analysis so we can make an informed decision. While the Prime Minister's undiplomatic behaviour at Buckingham Palace is providing comedians with new skit material, for Canadians this is no laughing matter. The relationship between Canada and the United States is crucial. Canada's foreign policy, domestic, defence policy and trade partnerships are all shaped by historically strong and positive relationship with the United States. What will this Prime Minister do to regain a sense of trust and partnership with the President of the United States so that Canada's interests are defended? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you what our Prime Minister will do and what he is already doing, and that is get a modernized trade deal with the United States, our neighbour and most important partner, ratified. And I must say, we are in a minority parliament. We are aware of that. And so this is a responsibility, and let me say it is a grave historical responsibility of every member of this House. The Honourable Member for Belay Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Steel is protected, but aluminum is not. Aluminum is made in Quebec and steel in Ontario. Once again, Ontario put the interests, or rather sacrificed the interests of Quebec over the interests of the rest of Canada. Aluminum workers were abandoned, just like dairy farmers before them, just like cheese farmers just like Rona, Rona's employees, forestry workers, and people who work in our shipyards in Quebec. It seems clear that the government is not protecting the workers of Quebec. Will they provide such a commitment? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government is determined to defend aluminum workers and the aluminum industry. We fought to have American tariffs on aluminum lifted completely. Only Canada and Mexico were able to do that. When the new NAFTA is ratified, we will have a guarantee of 70 percent of North American uh, aluminum in American, uh, North American built cars. Previously, that was zero percent. We need to get this deal ratified. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Well, it seems that only the government believes that, Mr. Speaker. Economic nationalism serves Quebecers and Quebec workers well, but the government is sacrificing that to the interests of the rest of Canada. The Prime Minister won't stop repeating that he's protecting aluminum workers. Well, it's true that he protected those who are in China, India and Russia. Does the Prime Minister realize that he is inviting aluminum plants to give up their investments in Quebec and move their investments to Asia so that the aluminum made there will then be imported back into Quebec? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's very important. This is a very important moment for the House. And it's important to talk about facts and reality. The reality is that this modernized agreement will provide benefits to the aluminum sector. It will provide gains to Quebec and to all Canadians. This is no time for partisanship. This is a time to defend the national interest. The Honourable Deputy de Burnaby Sud. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker, yesterday all parliamentarians agreed that the government needs to accept the court ruling on discrimination against Indigenous children. This means that the government needs to respect that ruling, stop taking uh, children and their families to court, and the government needs to ensure that children and their families uh, don't end up uh, before the courts or in the justice system. So my question is, will the Prime Minister now stop taking Indigenous children to court? 
The Honorable Minister for Indigenous Affairs. We need to compensate Indigenous children who suffer discrimination due to former government policies. We're looking for a fair and comprehensive policy. That's why I asked my Assistant Deputy Minister to speak to stakeholders and to try to find the best solution possible to deal with all children affected. Our goal is to ref reform uh, the child we welfare system, and this work is ongoing. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker, that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. Indigenous kids and their families have sent a clear message. Stop taking us to court yep. and stop discriminating against us. Yep. It's pretty simple. And the thing is, Mr. Speaker, the tribunal decision didn't just say that the government discriminated Indigenous kids. They said it was willful, right. it was reckless. Yep. And the result is kids are dying. So the question is very simple. The whole House agreed to follow the tribunal's decision. Yeah. Will this government basic, <coughs> respect basic human rights and stop taking Indigenous kids to court? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister for Indigenous Services. Again, today, Mr. Speaker, we are in full compliance with all of the CHRT's orders to address all the overrepresentation of First Nations children in care. We've almost doubled funding to Child and Family Services with over 483,000 Jordan principles requests that have been approved. And we agree that the most recent orders for compensation for First Nation children harmed by government policies must be respected. What the CHRT has asked parties to do is to sit down and work out what exactly the compensation will look like. And that's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister is very well known for her support for the international rules-based order. In fact, she once told this House that it was absolutely essential for Canada's interest to make sure we stand up for a rules-based order. Does the Deputy Prime Minister still believe it's essential for Canada to stand up for an international rule of law based order in all our trade agreements, including NAFTA. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me give you a few of the reasons why the new NAFTA is a much better agreement for supporting the rules based international order than the agreement it will replace. One is that in the new NAFTA, we have a much stronger state-to-state -state dispute settlement mechanism, formerly Chapter 20, now Chapter 31. Second, we have gotten rid of ISDS, which is inappropriate in our trade relationship with the United States. And third, we have maintained Chapter 19. Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, the international rules-based order is more than just a slogan, Mr. Speaker. This modernization of NAFTA, and particularly as it comes to aluminum, should ensure that the three partners in NAFTA adhere to the highest rules, ensure that there is no transshipment allowing foreign aluminum into our country, and to make sure that the rules of origin for steel can be applied to aluminum to make sure that our world-class sector is successful. Was the minister successful in all the aluminum rule of origin objectives in the negotiation? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, with regards to aluminum, let me tell you what our government has been successful in doing. First of all, we have been successful in getting the 232 tariffs on aluminum lifted. This is no small thing. And let's be clear, Canada is today the only major aluminum producer with tariff-free access to the U.S. market. Second, in the new NAFTA, which will come into force with support from my friends across the aisle very soon, I trust, the aluminum sector will benefit from an additional 70 percent content requirement. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, Sylvain Melte from the Steelworkers Union is here today uh, expressing his concerns about the aluminum sector and the fact that it's not further protected. The government was so eager to get a deal it failed to defend or respect the cleanest aluminum sector on the planet. I remember when the Prime Minister came to my riding and said, it swore up and down that he would fight to defend aluminum workers. What does he intend to do to protect our market and help export more aluminum from Saguenay? 
The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, today I also met with the uh, with the uh, Metal Workers Union, and I have visited their factories twice. We talked about the aluminum sector in Quebec. It was a constructive conversation, as all of my conversations with our uh, aluminum unions have been. As workers know, we are de committed to defending their sector and the workers. For Oshawa. Mr. Speaker, there's pain in Canada's auto industry. The loss of 1,500 jobs at Chrysler, 450 job losses at Ford, and the closing of our GM assembly plant in Oshawa. Evidence of a crisis ignored by this Prime Minister. Now at a time when he should be focusing on keeping jobs in Canada, the Prime Minister has agreed to new rules that hurt the Canadian aluminum industry and has spent his time focusing on the best way to draw the ire of the U.S. President. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, when will this Prime Minister start focusing on the crisis in Canada's auto sector? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've always supported the auto workers in the auto sector. It's investments by this government of $440 million that's leveraged over $6 billion of investments in the automotive sector since 2015. And in the first three years of our mandate, we've seen the creation of 10,000 new jobs in the automotive sector because we turned the corner as opposed to the Conservative government. In their first three years, they lost 20,000 jobs before the recession even hit. And with respect to the new NAFTA, the rules of origin will provide more opportunities for Canadian supply chain because more of those parts will be sourced locally. Honourable Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, while our neighbours to the south added more than 250,000 jobs last month, here in Canada, 71,000 Canadians wow. lost their jobs. Wow. And that's not even bad compared to what's happening in the natural resources and energy sector. Over the past two years, employment in Canadian mining, oil and, ca and gas has shrunk by over 3%. While in the U.S., in those same sectors, they've grown by over 15 per cent. This is what happens when you have a Prime Minister who does not support our oil, gas and mining sectors. When will the Prime Minister finally get to work doing something to get jobs back in these industries? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Speaker, um, I am happy to report that the past couple of weeks have been somewhat good for getting our resources to market. And I'll tell you why. construction on TMX underway, but I am also happy to report... I'm just going to have to interrupt the Honourable Minister for a second. I'm having a hard time hearing the answer, which I'm sure we're all looking forward to. Uh, some, I just want to remind some of the members, I know they're whispering, but their voices, some of them have wonderful voices that carry very well. I'm sure they don't mean to shout, it's just they're talking to someone nearby, and I want them to be conscious that there's an answer being answered. The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources. We on this side of the House understand that the sector is going through some trying times. But we know that it is getting better with the construction of the TMX pipeline. We know that it is getting better with Line 3, which is coming into service now on the Canadian side of the border. This not only provides opportunities for the industry per se, but it also provides opportunities for Indigenous workers along those pipeline routes, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, somewhat good is probably about a D plus where, uh, where we're from, so that's not good enough. And it's clear that the reason this is happening is because of government policies. The Prime Minister has really set the stage for a Made in Canada recession. And what's disturbing is that the Liberals don't seem to recognize this, and their somewhat good attitude is not good enough. So when will this government recognize that there is a part of this country that is literally in a crisis, families are being destroyed, hundreds of thousands of jobs are being lost, somewhat good is not good enough. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, 
I acknowledge that somewhat good is not good enough. But I would, but I would ask then, I would ask then, Mr. Speaker, if if a government was not able to get TMX built, and if a government was not able to get Line Three completed on the Canadian side of the border, what grade do you give that? Yeah. <laughs> I'd give it an F. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Mr. Speaker, I'll explain the reality to the Deputy Prime Minister. The reality is that the new NAFTA is a betrayal of aluminum workers in Quebec. That's workers in Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean, but also 900 workers of Alouette in Satil, 700 workers at Alcoa in Bécomo, families in Bécancourt and Deschambault. These people are just as important as our steel workers. These people and their jobs should be valued. Can the government explain why it thinks steel workers are worth more than aluminum workers in Quebec? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, what I will explain is that the new NAFTA is excellent for all Canadian workers, including aluminum workers. Jean Simard, the president of the Canadian Aluminum Association, even said that the new NAFTA is the right path to follow. These are aluminum workers saying this. Endangering the ratification of the new NAFTA would be putting partisan politics above the national interest. That's not what we're doing in our government. The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Métis, Matin, Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, the government claims that Quebec's interests and climate change are its priorities. But when the Bloc moved to add respecting Quebec's environmental laws to the throne speech, something that was explicitly requested by the Quebec government during the election campaign, well, both the Liberals and Conservatives voted against that. And yet, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the fight against climate change, it's essential to ensure that we have the most stringent environmental laws possible. Why is the government refusing to support both Quebec and the environment? The Honourable Minister of Transport. We are working constructively with all the provinces of Canada. And I can tell you that, for example, in transport, often environmental issues come up that have both a federal component and a provincial component. For example, in the case of the Lac Mégantic uh, trail, uh, rail um, detour, there are both provincial and federal considerations, and we respect that. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, the government says it understands the message that Quebec sent during the elections. The Conservatives, meanwhile, say that they want to defend Quebec's jurisdiction. But both of them voted against adding Quebec priorities to the throne speech. They voted against respecting Quebec's environment laws, against protecting supply management, against increasing health transfers. Mr. Speaker, how can the government justify this decision when it voted against Quebec's interests once again? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, there are 35 proud Quebecers sitting on this side of the House who have been working every day with the government of Quebec, with different municipalities in Quebec, and whether it comes to in infrastructure projects or environmental projects or the new Champlain Bridge toll, all of the investments that we've done you know, we do this because we care about the interests of Quebec and Quebecers. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, Canada has lost 71,000 jobs in November. We also know that there was a 13 percent increase in the insolvency rate. Half of Canadians are only $200 away from insolvency. And now we've learned that the default rate for non-mortgage-related debts has hit a record in recent months. 
Is this or is this not the necessary conditions for a recession? The Honorable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, four years ago, we had a very low rate of economic growth. We had uh, a very high rate of unemployment. So we decided to make investments in families and in infrastructure. Now we have an economy that is growing. Of course, there are always challenges, but we will continue to make those investments to improve things for people who are vulnerable and to create an economy that works for all Canadians. Tito Carlton. Speaker, we already know that we lost 71,000 jobs last month, that there has been a 13 percent increase to a 10-year high in the number of people who have become insolvent. Now we know as well that the rate of Canadians defaulting on non-mortgage credit reached its highest third quarter pace in seven years. Yep. Mr. Speaker, isn't this government creating the conditions for a made in Canada recession? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's always important to recognize that there are challenges. Canadians are going through challenges in parts of the country. We need to be focused on how we can deal with those challenges. At the same time, we need to recognize that investing in our collective future is the way that we can actually experience success. We've seen over a million new jobs created by Canadians over the last more than four years. We're going to continue to invest to deal with these challenges so that people can have confidence in their future, confidence in their future for themselves and their families. Well, member for Carlton. Well, confidence is not what uh, Equifax is expressing. Its vice president said, and I, I quote, there's been a significant increase in consumer bankruptcies. So now we have people, uh, a seven-year high in third quarter defaults on non-mortgage debt. We have a 10-year high in the number of people who have gone insolvent. 71,000 people losing their jobs. The minister continues to sing, don't worry, be happy, while Canadians are falling behind and losing their jobs. Why is he and his government continuing to create the conditions for a Made in Canada recession? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Actually, Mr. Speaker, we just came through an election campaign where we said, no, in fact, we need to pay very close attention to the challenges that Canadians are facing. And that's the reason that we need to continue to invest. That's the reason that we need to recognize that things like what we put forward this week, a reduction in taxes for 20 million Canadians, is an important way for them to feel a greater sense of confidence and uh, them having enough money to spend for themselves and their families. We are going to continue with our approach to invest. It has seen success. And of course, as we face challenges, it's important to stay on that track. Well, member for Tr uh, Churchill, Chiwetnuk Aski. Monsieur le Président, Lord... Mr. Speaker, when it comes to First Nations, this Prime Minister says one thing and does another. On the one hand, he says that he believes in reconciliation, and on the other, he's dragging First Nations children to court. Instead of starting reconciliation, his government is continuing colonization. Let's be clear, the negligence of this government towards these children is costing us lives. Will this government stop taking First Nations children to court? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister for Indigenous Services. Mr. Speaker, we have been fully upholding the tribunal's orders regarding the problems of the overrepresentation of children in foster care. We've doubled services to children and families. Almost 500,000 people due to, have been uh, beneficiaries of the Jordan Principle. We've agreed with the court's tribunal regarding the compensation to be paid to Indigenous children. Parties now need to sit down and determine what the compensation process will look like, and that's what we're going to do. Number four, Timmins, James Bay. Well, since this Prime Minister began his legal vendetta against the Human Rights Tribunal, we have lost over 100 First Nation children in Ontario alone, including 16-year-old Devin Freeman, who hung from a tree for seven months outside the group home. And it's been over a year since the Prime Minister's lawyers told the Rights Tribunal they were not going to negotiate with Cindy Blackstock about compensation. They would rather litigate, and they are still in court trying to quash the this decision. So Parliament has ordered this Liberal government to stop this vendetta. When are they going to call off their lawyers? Here, here. Honourable Minister for Indigenous Services. 
Mr. Speaker, we agree that we must compensate First Nations children harmed by past government policies. We're seeking a solution that is at the same time comprehensive, fair and equitable. And that's why I've instructed my Assistant Deputy Minister to work with those involved with the CHRT and those involved in the Mashoom class action to develop the best possible method that includes all affected children. Nothing about our commitment to implement other orders about this from the CHRT or reforming child and family services for that matter changes. This work will continue. The Honourable Member for Sydney, Victoria. This is my first time rising in this House. I would like to thank the good people from Sydney, Victoria for electing me as their Member of Parliament. I would also like to thank all the volunteers whose hard work resulted in our victory. The member has provided a translation of his question. According to the translation, it says, All my relations, we are currently in the United Nations Year of Indigenous Language. And while I understand legislation has been created to ensure protection of languages, my question for the Minister of Indigenous Services Canada is how do we plan on implementing the Language Act so that future generations of Indigenous peoples are given the resources to ensure they can continue to speak the language proudly? The Honourable Minister of Indigenous Services. According to the translation provided, the minister has thanked the member for his question. Those who know best how to revitalize their languages, indigenous peoples and teachers, and we're doing so by providing $337 million over the next five years for indigenous languages and $1,500 per year for each K-12 First Nations student as part of the new co-developed education funding policy. This government is firm in its resolve to support indigenous languages. Mr. Speaker, although 35 of their MPs were elected in Quebec, the Liberals haven't responded to any of Quebec's demands in the throne speech. No single tax return, no commitment for the third link in Quebec's regions, nor any will to grant more autonomy with the immigration system. One wonders what kind of agreement the government concluded with the bloc for it to support the throne speech so quickly. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There were no discussions in the hallways. The throne speech, as you know, is a document that talks about the broad themes that this government wants to implement. The details will come, the projects will come, and at that time, the opposition may judge us. The Honourable Member for Lévis Le Binière. Mr. Speaker, we, the Conservatives, truly care about the interests of Quebec's nation, and we will work tirelessly so that Quebec remains strong in a united Canada. Mr. Speaker, in the Bloc Québécois' eagerness to support the Liberals' throne speech, three of Quebec's demands were forgotten. A single income tax return, more autonomy for immigration, a third link between Levy and Quebec. Mr. Speaker, where are the Liberal MPs and the Bloc Québécois MPs when it's time to work in Quebec's best interests? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. We're here. There's 35. We're going to work for the interests of Quebec. And all I can say, Mr. Speaker, is that I hope the opposition will work with us for Quebec's interests and for Canada's interests. The Honourable Member for Yellowhead. Mr. Speaker, Premiers are united behind promoting our natural resources in a responsible manner. The export of more liquefied natural gas by Canadian producers will lower global emissions and create good, high-paying jobs. With 71,200 jobs lost last month, this could not come at a more important time. Mr. Speaker, will the Environment Minister commit to uniting Canadian of uh, amending the Bill C-69 to allow for the construction of more LNG facilities. Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, just to remind you, LNG Canada represents the single largest private sector investment in Canadian history. It's a $40 billion investment that is going to create 10,000 jobs at the height of construction and hundreds of millions of dollars in construction contracts for Indigenous businesses, all while having the lowest carbon intensity of any large-scale LNG facility in the world and helping to reduce 
coal plant emissions in Asian markets. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Langley, Aldergrove. Mr. Speaker, my home province of BC can contribute in a very significant way to the fight against global climate change by providing clean LNG to Canada and the rest of the world, yet this industry is suffering under excessive restrictions uh, and investors are losing confidence. Uh, Western Canada needs changes to Bill C-69, uh, the No More Pipelines Bill, so that the industry can be fully developed. When will the government make the necessary amendments to C-69? Here, here, here. good question. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Canada is well positioned to become a major player in the global LNG industry. We are taking action to be the world's cleanest producer of LNG. Projects like LNG Canada are creating jobs for Canadians, opportunities for Indigenous businesses. We were doing so well. I just want to remind everyone that when someone asks, answers a question, like whether they answer, uh, ask a question, we all want to hear what that is, so I'll let the minister uh, finish his, uh, his answer and hopefully we'll be able to hear it. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. There are a cop in Madrid right now and they are working hard to ensure that we get this right for the environment and for the economy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, Mr. Speaker, Raif Badawi started a new hunger strike, another hunger strike to call the world's attention to who is unfair imprisonment in Saudi Arabia, another hunger strike to draw Canada's attention, which has left him to languish in prison for seven years, another hunger strike, which is going to further accentuate the worries of his wife and Saf Haidar and their children. Her spouse, their children, they miss him. What is it going to take for this government to act to free Raif Badawi? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The protection of human rights, including the right to freedom of expression, conscience and religion or belief, are an integral part of Canada's foreign policy. We remain extremely concerned by Raif Badawi's case. Highest levels, we have repeatedly called for clemency to be granted. We will stand with Mr. Badawi. We will stand with people facing human rights atrocities around the world. The Honourable Member for Montarville. Mr. Speaker, it is no longer time for rhetoric. It's scandalous that after seven years, Raif Badawi is still languishing in prison without having committed a single crime. If the government can sit down and work with Saudi Arabia at the G20, if it can sit down with Saudi Arabia to do business, including to sell it weapons, it can certainly sit down with Saudi Arabia and demand that Raif Badawi be freed. What real actions does the government plan to take to finally have him freed? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Let me assure you and all members of this House that our hearts go out to Mr. Badawi and his family. The Prime Minister has spoken directly to the Saudi Crown, Crown Prince and to the King of Saudi Arabia about this particular case. We've raised the case directly to the Saudi Minister of Foreign Affairs. Our goal is not to grandstand, is to work persistently, calmly and patiently to have Mr. Badawi reunited with his family. The Honourable Member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Mr. Speaker, as this is my first time uh, asking a question in the House, I'd be remiss if I didn't first thank the constituents of Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, yeah, 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 yeah. for giving me the pleasure of continuing to serve Canadians and serve them. I was very disappointed last week while listening to the throne speech to hear very little mention of rural Canada and our critical and diverse agricultural sector. That's right. Ontario farmers are suffering from a lack of processing capacity and their inability to sell fed cattle to the United States. The government missed a critical deadline to apply to the World Organization for Animal Health for negligible risk status. Why? Good question. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, our, we understand that the closure of a meat processing plant uh, in Ontario has significant impact on our cattle producers, but we cannot compromise on food safety. Our government is working with the industry and with the province of Ontario to find short-term alternatives and to see how the meat processing capacity can be increased. Yeah. Yeah. Number four, Battle River Crowfoot. 
Mr. Speaker, Battle River Crowfoot is proud to produce some of the best beef in the world. Yet we are still recovering from the BSE crisis that nearly devastated the industry a decade and a half ago. However, on this road to recovery, it was dealt a significant setback when the Liberals missed a simple deadline to apply to the World Organization for Animal Health for a negligible risk status. Alberta ranchers are suffering due to this Liberal mistake. Can the Minister of Agriculture please explain to the Canadian beef industry simply why this deadline was missed? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government will always stand up for ranchers and farmers. We know how important it is for the beef sector to be granted negligible BSE risk status. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency is working with the beef sector to develop a strong submission to the World Organization for Animal Health for Spring 2020. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Mr. Speaker, as this is my first opportunity to rise in this House, I would like to thank the residents of Chatham, Kent Leamington for the opportunity to serve. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal failure to apply for the negligible risk status with the World Organization for Animal Health last July was a shocking sign of incompetence. Because of this ridiculous misstep, Canadian fed cattle cannot be sold into the U.S. market. Why then did the Prime Minister reappoint the same agricultural minister after she missed an application deadline that is costing our Canadian farmers dearly? The Honourable Minister for Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government will always stand with our ranchers and farmers. We know how important it is for the beef sector to be granted negligible BSE risk status. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency is working with the the beef sector to develop a strong submission to the World Organization of Animal Health for spring 2020. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to remind the honourable members, whether they're making a statement or whether they're shouting across the hall, certain words should not be said in Parliament. I'm sure that the honourable members don't want to be pointed out, but I just want to remind everyone there's certain words that are borderline and they are somewhat offensive. The honourable member for Whitby. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As this is the first time uh, for me to rise in this House, I want to thank the the residents of Whitby. Mr. Speaker, this government's Canada Child Benefit is the most innovative social policy in a generation. It's put more money tax-free in the pockets of 9 out of 10 families, and it's helped lift nearly 300,000 children out of poverty. Could the Minister of Families tell the House how this government will build on the success of the CCB and continue to provide assistance to parents and children who need it most? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member from Whitby for the question, and I want to take an opportunity to really congratulate him for his uh, election to this House. Our government introduced and increased the Canada Child Benefit precisely to help families meet the rising costs of raising children. That is why we also recognize that there is more work to do in this in in this uh, issue, and that is why we will be boosting the Canada Child Benefit by an additional 15% for kids under the age of one. This will ensure that up to $1,000 more will go directly to families when they need it the most. The Honourable Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Residents in eastern Ontario have been waiting more than six months for an answer from the federal government on key infrastructure dollars. Back in July, several projects like the Morseburg Streetscape project and the Kempville County Road 43 widening were approved by the Ontario government. With no reply from this government, another construction season has been lost to get shovels in the ground. When will the federal government's dither and delay approach end so municipalities in rural eastern Ontario can get these projects built? The Honourable Minister for Women's Services. Mr. Speaker, our government will always stand with Canadians, particularly those in small rural communities, to ensure that they maintain the health, 
and the vitality of their communities by investing in infrastructure. Sure, sure, right. We Excellent. are working closely with municipalities as well as provinces who are nominating initiatives. We have a small communities fund carved out in our infrastructure uh, envelope worth $2 billion. Year, and we look year. forward to connecting Canadians in smaller communities so that we can all thrive. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Speaker, in August, the Chief of Police for the City of Toronto shared the shocking news that over 300 people accused on firearms charges were walking free on bail. Free to terrorize the GTA. Mr. Speaker, criminals know the punishment does not fit the crime. They know they have a long list of rights and their victims have none. Why is the Liberal government putting the rights of criminals before the rights of their victims and innocent firearms owners in places like Perry Sound, Muskoka? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, we take the safety of all Canadians in every community very seriously, and that's precisely why our government is going to strengthen gun control. We're going to ensure that police and prosecutors have the tools and the resources they need to keep their community safe. We're going to invest in kids and in communities to help them make better decisions. Mr. Speaker, we're taking real action. I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing the answer. I just thought I'd uh, stop for a second and let it calm down. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. As I've said, Mr. Speaker, we're taking real action to deal with violence in all of our communities. We're taking action to keep our neighbourhoods safe and to deal with gun and gang violence. We're taking real action to reduce rural crime, and we're taking real action to reduce violence against women and vulnerable people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Media are reporting that a public servant, servant at the Department of Canadian Heritage was punished for criticizing the Prime Minister. Munjet Baines was sent in an interview that she was shocked when she saw the Prime Minister do blackface. She said it didn't make sense for anyone to do that, regardless of the year. When the interview was brought to the attention of her superiors, she was reprimanded. Can the government confirm if this media report is true? The Honourable Minister. Oh. Uh. The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Our world-class public servant do incredible work for Canadians, and we thank them for their efforts. Employees at the Ministry of Canadian Heritage work under a specific set of rules stated in its Code of Conduct. This is in addition to the rules of the Public Service Commission set out for all civil servants, Mr. President. There is an ongoing grievance on this specific case, and we cannot further comment. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Brome, Mrs. Squa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Women's Entrepreneurship was on November 19th. It was an opportunity to reflect on the advancement of women's entrepreneurship. Although we still have a lot of work to do, the future is promising. 39% of new businesses created in 2018 were led by women. Can the Minister of Small Business and Export Promotion and International Trade share with this House progress made with the Women's entrepreneur Entrepreneurship Strategy? The Minister of Small Business. First time speaking in this House, I want to thank the people of Markham Thornhill for their confidence in me to represent them here. And I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Our government is committed to the success of women entrepreneurs and women-led and owned businesses. It's why we invested $2 billion on the first ever women's entrepreneurship strategy. This investment is going to add up to $150 billion to the Canadian economy by 2026. We are proud to double the number of female entrepreneurs, helping them export and to create more good jobs for middle-class Canadians. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, on the West Coast, we are facing a wild salmon emergency with disastrous effects for our region. Historic lows in wild salmon returns and the near extinction of some iconic runs require urgent action from this government. The situation has been getting worse. We need new investment now for Pacific wild salmon habitat restoration, enhancement and protection. Will the minister let Pacific wild salmon go the way of the Atlantic cod? Or will she address this crisis with an emergency relief package Will she act now, Mr. Speaker? Here, here, here. 
The Honourable Minister for Fisheries and Oceans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, this is the first time I rise in this House. I want to thank the people of South Shore St. Margaret's for re electing me. I'd also like to congratulate the Honourable Member across the way for his re election. I look forward to working with him on issues that are important to all Canadians. Mr. Speaker, wild Pacific salmon is extremely important to our economy, to our culture in BC. We know how important it is. That's why we will continue to work with our, our, our stakeholder groups, our partners, in order to make sure that we, we continue to work with this, uh, this, uh, this important species and we look forward to working across the way with all members of this House to deal with these issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government is considering approving the Tech Frontier mine in northern Alberta. It will become one of the largest oil sands mines in Canada and generate a massive increase in carbon emissions, destroying nearly 3,000 hectares of old growth forest and 14,000 hectares of wetlands. Some affected First Nations were not consulted because they are in the Northwest Territories. They oppose this project. Mr. Speaker, will the government do the right thing and say no to Tech Frontier? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure my colleague that under the new Impact Assessment Act, uh, we will do our homework. Uh, we oversee fair and thorough environmental assessments that are grounded in science, evidence and Indigenous traditional knowledge. This is a major project. We're very conscious of it that our government will need to decide on in the next year or so in the context of a range of factors. Thank you. Bravo, Mark. And that concludes question period for today. Nous avons un... There is a call to order by the member for Saint Jean. Mr. Speaker, I am asking for unanimous consent from the House on the following motion that it be resolved.